Hey, this is Josh Mandel back with another guided walk through fire. And this time we're going to continue on last week's uh, session looking at terminology or vocabularies in fire. And as a quick reminder, last week we focused on one particular data type, a uh, very flexible data type in fire called codable concept. Uh, and we looked at how codable concept can be used to capture a text description of some concept, and optionally, a whole list of different codings, different translations that all um, are representations of that same concept. And we saw how codable concept is used uh, in really important places like uh, observation.code uh, to capture information about what exactly has been observed. Um, and the nice thing about codable concept here is that even if a client knows some slightly different vocabularies than you know, uh, you can provide a list of translations and the client can sort of find the translation it understands in that concept list. So that's an example of, of one of the places where codable concept is useful. What I would like to do in today's session is look at a few of the other different types of data types in FHIR where coded data can be represented. And maybe what I'll do to start is just have a look at the FHIR spec uh, itself. And right now we're looking at the data types page. And there's, there's a couple buckets of data types here. There's what are called primitive types. And so if you're used to looking at FHIR JSON, these are things that are represented just as uh, strings or numbers, as simple values in JSON. Um, strings, numbers, booleans. And then there's what FHIR here calls general purpose data types, or elsewhere we call them complex data types. And these are things that sort of sit between curly braces in JSON, things that have their own sub properties to them. Uh, and codable concept, of course, is one of those general purpose or complex data types. But today we're going to look in a couple of places in the spec. We're going to look at the code data type um, and see where that's used and why it's useful. And if you follow the arrows here, we can see that the code data type is represented as a string um, in JSON. It's a sort of string typed data. We will also look at the coding data type, one of the complex data types, and that is a subclass of, of element. Um, so let's take a quick look. Uh, for, from, from the primitives on up, we'll build in complexity. So let's start with something like uh, the code data type. So let's look at the patient resource to understand how this code data type is used. So I can sort of search through the structure for patient here and see uh, what different data types are being used. And so here's a place where the code data type is used. This is kind of a controversial one to, to pick. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if it's the best first example, uh, but it does um, tell the whole story unto itself. So let's, let's take a quick look. Patient.gender is an optional value, zero or one, and it's represented using a fire code. And what that means is that the value is always going to be one of the things in this value set. We say that it's bound to the administrative gender value set, and it's a required binding. And maybe in a future lesson, we'll talk more about these different binding types. Uh, but when we use the code data type, the binding is really always what's called a required binding, because these, are, these will be your only choices. Uh, it's worth mentioning this text here on the screen that I'm selecting here. This is part of the short description for this gender data element. And sometimes the number of values can be longer than actually fits in this line, and you'll see a little dot, dot, dot. So really, if you want to see the source of truth, the thing to do is click on the value set itself down here, which I've opened in a new tab, and that way we'll get a, a full rendering uh, of all the different options in this administrative gender value set. Uh, and in a future lesson, we'll talk more about what value sets are uh, and how they're used. But for today's session, uh, I think the important thing is to understand that value sets are a way of capturing a bunch of different coded values in FHIR and being able to point to the whole set and say, use one of these at this spot in your resource. And so the most important part of this value set for us is here where all the different codes in the value set are enumerated. And so this code column here tells us what's going to be shown over the wire inside of a resource instance. So we'll see something like um, in the patient resource, let's look at some of the examples for patient, just see a general purpose example, 
and go into the JSON format, and we'll see something like uh, gender male. And so this string here is coming from this column of this value set, male. Um, now the value set also defines some other properties of these codes. So each one can have a display and a definition. These are not uh, populated in very great detail here, um, but in general, this could provide more information. And each, uh, each of these codes also, in some sense, belongs to a certain coding system. And when we talked about codable concepts, we looked at how these systems can appear over the wire. But if you are paying close attention, you'll notice that this system actually doesn't appear over the wire. I just put the simple string mail here. Uh, and that's okay because of the way the fire resource is defined. When we look at the fire patient resource, since we're using the code data type and it's got a required binding, there's no ambiguity about what system uh, what, what system is associated with any of these codes. So I don't need to tell you all this information about a system and a value. The only thing that matters is this code. Uh, everything else is fixed by the context of this definition. So that's an example of where code can be used. And the reason that code is used here, instead of something more flexible, um, is because the work group that was putting together the data model for this patient resource was able to get agreement and say, these are, these are the only values that uh, will make sense to use in this slot. And so if you can get that kind of agreement and understand up front that that value set is uh, enough to cover all of your use cases, then it's valuable to sort of lock that in um, because it means that downstream you're going to have very consistent behavior. Not only does it take up less space over the wire, but you know that people aren't going to have any surprising values here. Uh, now, as a separate kind of social comment, I will know that um, gender is a very rich and interesting construct uh, that obviously has a lot more facets than just an enumeration of four values. And a lot of discussion went into this uh, in FIRE, but the, the basic concept here is that if you want to express more information about a gender than this code allows you to express, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the expectation is if, uh, if none of these choices applies, well, there's one of these values is other, and one of these values is unknown. And so you would pick one of those in the core fire patient dot gender value, and then you would supply additional information in an extension. So you might have a much richer value set that gave you um, additional facets of gender identity. And fire doesn't prevent you from expressing those things. They just don't go directly in patient dot gender. They might go in extensions on the patient dot gender element. Uh, and in fire that would appear as uh, in, in JSON as uh, patient dot underscore gender, and then you would have an object where you could attach various extensions. Um, so that's just sort of a, a little bit of a side note, but I, I know that this is an important topic uh, and one that often when people look at the fire spec, uh, they think this is, this is way too limited. And in a sense, they're right. And it's the fire extension mechanism that really provides uh, additional controls there. So that's one example where the code data type is, is often used. I'll show you one other example, and this is maybe the, the a more canonical example to keep in mind, which has to do with statuses. So let's think about the allergy intolerance resource, and let's look at the places where code is used here. So here uh, we can see each allergy intolerance has a type. It's either an allergy or it's an intolerance. So that's represented as a code, and there's a very small value set associated here that has those two values. And here you can see a little bit more about what it means to include a definition um, and all this display information. But this, again, is what goes over the wire. Uh, similarly, uh, an allergy intolerance can have a category. Uh, and it's actually kind of surprising to me that this is represented as a code, um, because in most resources, categories represent a more flexible value set. Um, but again, what this implies is that there was agreement among the work group that was building this allergy intolerance resource that said, actually, food, medication, environment, and biologic that value set of allergy types with those four uh, possibilities is enough to basically cover the use cases for which this resource is defined. So rather than cracking open a more complex data type uh, and allowing uh, all kinds of different systems and values to be used, there's just a code data type used here. Um, and similarly, criticality. There's a, a choice between just a few values. It's an optional value, so you, you might leave it off altogether. But if you're supplying a criticality, it's either low, high, or unable to assess. So that's, those are kinds of examples about when you should think about using the code 
uh, data type, or when the, the fire specification authors think about using the code data type. Um, so we talked about code, it's the smallest one of these coded values. We talked about codable concept, which is sort of the, the Cadillac with a whole list of translations. Um, there's one more that I want to take a look at, which is the coding data type. And, and you've actually already seen it before if you were paying close attention, because when we looked at the codable concept, we said the codable concept inside of it can have an array of codings. So anytime you've got a codable concept, you know, you've already got codings inside. But let's think about the coding data type itself and uh, where it's used directly in Fire. And as a review from the last time, we said a coding most importantly has a, a system and a code and a display value that captures the information um, about what this concept is. Uh, and usually we see this, this data type inside of codable concepts. But and there are some places uh, where, we, where we might find examples of a coding alone. I'm going to show you one, which is sort of work in progress on the subscription resource in Fire. Um, so in Fire, subscriptions are designed to make it easy for a client to ask for notifications about changes to the data in a system. So rather than having to pull a server and maybe once every 10 seconds ask it if something is new, I could register a subscription with the server and ask the server to just notify me when new data comes in. That's what a subscription is all about. Uh, and the idea with subscriptions is there are different channels. So maybe I register a subscription uh, so I'll receive an email every time there's something new. Or maybe I want somebody to post a payload to a REST endpoint. Or maybe I want them to send something through a WebSocket. Those are examples that we call different subscription channels. And we use the coding data type here to capture these channels uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we didn't want to go with a simple code because we wanted this value set to be extensible. We wanted to define a few different channel types in the core spec, but we wanted to make sure that anybody who was creating subscriptions in their own server could extend our basic set of channel types with new channel types. Maybe you want to support a cloud messaging queue, and that's not something that was defined in the core spec. So by using a coding instead of a code, we allow for that kind of uh, dynamic or runtime extensibility. And so when we look at this value set, we can see there's um, five different channel types defined in the core spec. REST hook, WebSocket, email, and so on. And in this case, when we see a system defined as part of the fire spec, this system does appear over the wire. We have to supply the system as well as the code anytime we want to communicate um, this channel type. And the reason is that to make this extensible, people need to be able to send information about their own codings in their own systems uh, when the need arises. So if we look at some of the examples of the subscription data type, we can drill in and, and see uh, a JSON example. And so in this case, the channel type, <laughs> this is fun. So the channel type only has the code here. And this is actually a little bit of a bug. We should have a code as well as a system populated. So I'll write a note um, to, to file a quick issue on that one. Uh, but either way, you can see that there's a slot here to include a code as well as a system inside of these curly braces. So we couldn't use a code alone. Um, we needed to use a coding or a codable concept. Why did we choose a coding instead of a codable concept here? Uh, why not go all the way to the Cadillac of coded data? Uh, and the short answer is any given subscription needs to be registered by the server and directly understood. Either the server understands what, what kind of a channel the client is asking for, and it'll open the channel and work, or the server really doesn't understand it and it's going to close it and forget about it. Uh, it'll deny the request. So we used a coding here because in this instance, translations really don't make sense. Uh, if I'm just sending you a piece of text, you don't have any way to handle that uh, directly and automatically. And if I'm sending you translations into three different coding systems, um, that's all going to be extraneous information. So this is one of the few places in the fire spec where we use the coding data type directly. Uh, we knew that code wouldn't fit, and we knew that codable concept didn't really make sense. The general principle is you want to use um, the, the sort of narrowest data type that you can without foreclosing future use cases and possibilities. So that's been a quick look at a few of the coding data types in Fire. We looked at the smallest primitive called code, uh, which makes sense in the context of a data model that can really be constrained. We looked at uh, the sort of medium concept here of a coding, 
which is a way to supply uh, a system as well as a value from that system, but just one, no translations uh, and no free text. And then we looked at the codable concept, which is most appropriate if you're not sure you're going to have a coding, or if you might want to be able to express multiple translations of those codings at the same time. Uh, and in the course of looking through this, we talked a little bit about subscriptions, we talked a little bit about allergies, we talked a little bit about observations and patients and gender, and I hope that gives you a little bit better sense of how the fire spec is designed to work with these uh, coded vocabulary systems. And we'll continue lessons on vocabulary in the next session.